tra a trash pack in front of this enforcer that only goes away once you kill the very first boss, right? So you can't actually pull the enforcer on top of it unless you pull the trash pack too, because if you pull it, it will walk through the trash pack and get the whole trash, uh, the whole this big trash pack back up as well. But we actually see a very different strat coming out of Team Poluca here. So they're doing exactly what you said. They're pulling this enforcer from the bridge. They also pull the trash pack that was standing just in front there, and they're killing that instead of uh, the other strats that we have seen from the uh, groups before. Well, it doesn't really matter which one of the two enforcer packs you kill. You gotta kill one, either the one that Copenhagen pulled in front of the boss's kind of ring area, or the one down the stairs from Team Poluca. The only difference really is the Team Poluca one has one extra hound in it, uh, which is just a bit more tank damage, but shouldn't be too much of concern for them. Uh, a lot of difficulty here for Copenhagen early on, though, as Haruder goes down, gravity falls oh. as well. Both rogues and a full team wipe coming out of Copenhagen, along with the extra death as uh, they try to kind of rush back with it. So six deaths on the board for them. Bloodlust just now falling off for Team Poluca as they manage to clean up the rest of the trash that they pulled in. I mean, the elemental damage, uh, the elemental shaman damage kind of proving why it belongs there. Definitely. They also popped their Bloodlust, of course, for this big pull that they did. Now, Copenhagen, they chose to save their Bloodlust and immediately just it went wrong from the get-go. Now, they, what they're actually trying to do is uh, killing the start instead uh, of doing this pull that they tried to do before, um, which probably makes their route different now. I'm not sure why they're doing this, but maybe they don't have the shot available anymore or they don't have their shadow melt, so they have to kill it. But Team Poluca already, Proctor Reaping already uh, fighting the very first boss here. Yeah, I would assume it's just that they don't feel comfortable getting back to uh, the trash that they were at before. Team Poluca pulling that first Reaping on top of Sky Captain Craig. Of course, I want to remind those at home that we have now moved over to Teeming and Volcanic. Teeming means that there are more trash mobs present in the dungeon. You also require to kill more trash in order to complete your 100%. Also also quaking, just really mo more of a nuisance. Uh, every, uh, every 20 seconds or so, there will be a ring around players that pulses for 20% of their max HP. You can't hit other players with it, and if you're caught casting during the hit, you will get interrupted and silenced. Yeah, so quaking can be dangerous in some of the boss fights, especially if you have to stack up somewhere and then you get the quaking in the wrong moment where you don't want it. But we see Team Paluka here fighting uh, the very first uh, boss, Scrag. Uh, Crag, he is doing some abilities that you need to watch out for, especially this big shot so he targets run a uh, random player and he will do those massive single target shot towards this player now if you stand in the way you will get hit as well so you need to make sure that you position uh, you position properly here and it's especially difficult the more melees you have we've seen a lot of like triple melee setups so uh, there's only that much space around the bus and the shot that goes towards a player has a, a decently wide a cone so you need to make sure that you uh, have this uh, pretty much square angle around the bus so if the shot goes on one player the other one is not getting hit by it as well we see dj first safely sitting outside the ring is not to have to deal with any of the uh, parrot poop that comes down raining upon the ring uh, also you don't have to move for the parrot when it comes down and charges across the arena so he can just mostly sit there safely and just tunnel the boss no problem down to 35 percent now for team pool luca looking really solid here as they slowly kite around the circle now um, um, God uh, is sitting, of course, opposite end of the circle from where the melee are to not only bait some of the parrot poop that comes down, but bait those shots that you mentioned in that direction. Yeah, so there was actually a strategy that worked in this boss before where you could actually just drag the boss out of the arena with all the melee uh, and all the DPS, except the only person who would stay inside the arena was the healer. Now, the healer would bait all the birds, uh, all the pools underground, so anyone else didn't really have to deal with any of the boss's ability. But um, they did change this boss now, so as soon as you drag him out, he will actually uh, reset. So you need to keep him inside of the arena. The only people who can stay outside and still avoid uh, the pools underground and avoid the birds are the ranged DPS. Yes, as we see Frusha, of course. Copenhagen finally getting themselves back and recomposed as they are at 26% trash. So a bit of extra trash that they likely did not intend to clear, but they did have that wipe. So I have to choose uh, uh, through an opening, essentially, to get back to it. Sky Captain Craig at 65% for them, and they indeed did use their bloodlust on the pole there. Poluka now downing the first boss and getting ready to move over to the bridge uh, where they've already previously cleared that enforcer uh, that we were talking about earlier. So they can just safely mount up and go past the bridge. Uh, obviously, if you had a warlock, you can skip over uh, kind of the corner of the bridge and skip that mob entirely, but not part of this meta. Yeah, so if the enforcer is there, uh, there's other scripts you can do, like the rogue uh, pulling it away uh, and everyone else walking past and then a rogue coming back. But all of this, of course, uh, costs you some time, right? And as we mentioned before, Team Poluca just does not have five night elves because they have this shaman who cannot be a night elf. So they don't have this option of just doing a skip and shadow melting at the very end. So they have to be mindful of how their routes turns out to be.
Yeah, of course, uh, not many Night Elves left after the burning of Telder Sil, so Shaman just can't go in that direction. Team Puluka now doing a, a fairly modest pull here in front of the second boss area, looking to likely use the Reaping to their advantage soon with either a larger pull. Actually, they actually multiply the pull in the direction of Trothak, the third boss. More kind of come in on top of them. We do have a Trapper in there as well. Particularly dangerous mob as he puts down these blue traps that you see on the screen right now. Uh, falling victim to those will root you in place and put a fairly heavy dot on you, and you certainly don't want to be rooted uh, as a full melee squad, almost a full melee squad, excuse me, almost forgot about Shaman, <laughs> uh, but with Quaking coming out is what I wanted to mention. Yeah, so Gatia just went back and pulled that trapper, that rat, down while uh, Flick actually went and pulled something else on top, and now they just keep chaining, which is something you usually don't really want to do with rogues because they want to get out of combat, they want to resell to get their opener in, but uh, we just see them here uh, just chain pulling on top and we see Frusha actually struggling a little bit with the damage here because he probably does not have his cooldowns ready or saving them for a later pull but we see the rogues of course they don't need cooldowns they just do damage all the time that is what rogues are <laughs> best at uh, doing uh, DJ Frusch having uh, yeah, just getting some of that ramp up done not really the most effective pulls for this uh, elemental shaman they want to just have a mass pull group everything up instead of just constantly drib uh, dribbling in excuse me uh, three, four, five targets at a time. Copenhagen has now downed the first boss and is making their way over. Unfortunately, their bridge is blocked off by this enforcer. Somebody has run too close to it and pulled it. Not sure if on purpose or not. We'll see if they use a meld or just kind of combine the enforcer with some of the trash that Team Poluka is uh, already working on. Now, one of the things I really like about this dungeon, Nigger, is it, it's so open. You can do the council next. You can do Trothak next. You can even do Harlan, the last boss, technically last boss of the dungeon uh, as your second boss. So many trash packs to opt through if you want. Yeah, so the second boss here, the, the pirate event, uh, is important though because if you do not kill this boss, then your respawn point is going to be the entrance of the dungeon, or on the first boss rather, instead of uh, spawning here right where the pirate event is. So some teams choose to kill this boss early because we talked about this a lot, but we don't have a lot of battle rests in those groups. So for Team Poluka, it's only the rest of the and also for Copenhagen, it's, uh, it's actually the rest of the and the DK. So with less battle rests available to you, if one person dies, especially if the healer dies, if you have your respawn, just be a lot closer. It's just so much safer for the group instead of walking all the way from the first boss uh, to this place, especially when there's mobs in between and reaping mobs that you need to skip somehow. Fairly juicy pull coming here from Team Pool Lucas. They combine the 40% or second reaping wave along with, uh, I believe, a double trash pack, if I'm not mistaken there. So a lot of mobs to be cleaving down. Huge amounts of damage coming out of DJ Frusha, showing why he belongs here on this team right now. Copenhagen just now finishing off with a trash pull of their own where uh, the prot warrior certainly flexed that T-clap, thunderclap muscle, uh, making sure to top the damage meters right beforehand. <laughs> uh, now they're looking like they did up a bit of a smaller pull, Copenhagen there, probably to proc their reaping as well at, in a moment at 40% and get ready to either pull it with a boss or with some trash, hopefully. Yeah, we see Gravity actually not being in range here of uh, the tank, so he's probably going around pulling some mobs uh, uh, on top of the tank. Now, as I said earlier, rogues do have tricks, right, which misdirects their aggro generated a little bit to the tank, meaning they can just uh, pop their tricks on the tank, which is an infinite range once it's applied, and then they can just walk around, pull mobs, and they will just keep running to the tank, which is very important for those kind of pulls that are coming from all directions because if you pull from three different directions and you don't have aggro on everything then it's on the way they're just gonna kill the healer most likely. Nice shot there of Gatia yeah, making sure to grab the pig and bring home the bacon for the team <laughs> as they start the event for Ludwig van Tortolen to spawn here in the ring. Now the nice thing about the ring of booty here is that you get to pull a lot of really efficient and effective and quite frankly not too difficult trash around the outside of the arena while you have those 25 to 30 second uh, RP your role-playing spawn times for Ludwig, followed by, of course, Trothak, the third boss. Yeah, so Ludwig is actually considered a trash mob, so uh, once Reaping spawns, Ludwig will be part of this Reaping wave with a lot of HP. So what people tend to do with this uh, Reaping wave, especially uh, with Ludwig, uh, Ludwig's soul inside as well, you either skip it with Shadow Melt somehow, or you pull it on top of something else that is very that takes a long time to kill, like the boss, for example, because it just has so much HP. 
Uh, we see a lot of uh, good shell dodging coming out here from Fusha, uh, Fusha, excuse me, uh, as the 60% uh, third reaping wave comes in on top of Ludwig for them. So they'll be happily cleaving that down as they move out of these extremely fast moving shells on the ground. Copenhagen, 57% on the board for Trash, also rearing up to, uh, likely looks like they are indeed as well stealthing to the Ring of Booty, getting ready to spawn their third reaping wave. So now we're starting to see similar pulls and strategies coming out of both teams. Unfortunately, Copenhagen if, uh, is held up because of their earlier wipe. Yeah, so Simple Luca does have the Bloodlust uh, ready soon, so interesting to see what they're gonna do with this Bloodlust. Uh, it is tyrannical, of course, so the boss fights do take a long time, and especially this uh, next boss, the Shark Puncher, is uh, gonna take a long time, and it's also a pretty dangerous boss, because uh, he does throw sharks at random players, usually ranged players, and we actually have two ranged in this group, which is not very common for the MDI right now, but we do have the Elemental Shaman and the Rest of Druid, so the Rest of Druid needs to make sure he takes those sharks away as they fixate the closest uh, player to them and kites them around the room so DJ Fu can stand still and do damage. Yeah, uh, Trothak always been a bit of a fishy character there as he enters the arena slowly for Team Pool Luka. Uh, certainly in their favor, though, as you mentioned, they do have that range that can help uh, kite the Sharks, but not only that, but they can freely DPS during that Whirlwind phase, so uh, a lot of good damage here. Bloodlust is available for Team Pool Luka. Now, we've seen this used in various ways for the teams. Some people say with the Council of Captains. We are in a tyrannical setting. We know how easily a player can be gibbed by Eudora shots. Uh, some save it for Harlan, and we've seen the final trash being pulled on top of Harlan at the end. And of course, Trothak, um, you know, perhaps not the most efficient use of it on, a, uh, on occasion of using a lot of melee, but nonetheless, they do pull Trothak here along with their 80% reaping wave, start to cleave everything down. No use of Bloodlust just yet for them. Yeah, so if they don't use Bloodlust now, they probably don't use it at all, unless they're waiting for some big coolness to come up. But we see uh, the big uh, reaping soul, the last soul from Ludwig here uh, with a lot of HP. They obviously want to try to focus the boss as much as they can. But while the boss is casting this whirlwind where the melees can't really stand in unless they have a, a defensive cooldown ready, they can do damage to the souls instead. So a very efficient pull here. Uh, when the melees can't hit the boss, they just hit uh, Ludwig's soul instead. Sternkeeper being cast by DJ Frusha, and as Zaronik so aptly uh, mentioned yesterday, having the lost soul with the high amount of HP here will increase the amount of Lava Burst uh, procs that DJ Frusha will get from his uh, two DOT applications, uh, just increasing the overall damage and getting some Maelstrom build as well. So really, you'll probably see both of these die at around the same time to maximize their single target on Trothak, which just has an immense amount of HP. HP, uh, health, and of course, just melee are very ineffective in terms of consistent DPS on Trothak. Copenhagen, not to be forgotten on the right side there, is just now pulling Trothak themselves. Uh, no bloodlust coming out of them as this still has a 54 second cooldown. Likely we'll be seeing it later either with Harlan or with the Council of Captains. Yeah, good, to, good that you mentioned the damage of the Elemental Shaman. As we can see, he's also standing on the left side of this arena because there's act actually dummies uh, just outside the arena. So Prusha can actually put his dots on the those damage during the boss fight and getting those uh, increased procs on the boss. So very efficient here. And just show tech, as we can see, um, the healer, of course, Gotcha just kiting those sharks around. Of course, DJ Fusha doesn't want to deal with them because if he's moving, he's not doing damage. So we see uh, the charge as well coming in. So sometimes Shrotek will uh, ch charge at the shark and pick him up. So you need to make sure that you're not in between the shark and the boss because if you get hit by the charge, you gain damage and you also get knocked back. Yeah, I certainly want to move out of the way of those. Now, when he does throw a shark at, at one of the players, it will actually start bouncing, as we can see in the far side of the screen there, towards the closest proximity player um, at, at quite a high speed. So the way to stop them is by kiting them through some of these chum pools or, or blood pools on the ground. It'll slow the sharks down by 50%, making them much easier to handle. Trothak down to 10% for Team Poluka here as they start to kind of kite around in the corner. Uh, Ludwig still has a fair bit of health, so they're probably going to want to kind of crank the damage on that so it's not waste too much time once Trothak that dies unless they decide to pull it directly into another trash pack. Team Copenhagen, 50% just now on Trothak as he charges off and grabs another shark. Yeah, so uh, Copenhagen doesn't choose to pull the reaping on top of uh, Troth Shack here. They don't. They didn't trigger it yet. That means uh, after this boss, they will have to trigger the reaping. Either they skip it because, as I said, they will get Ludwig's soul, which has so much HP compared to all their other reaping mobs. So either they do an uh, efficient pull later where they pull trash on top of that reaping, or they just try to completely skip it with their shadow melt, which is a little bit of di a little bit difficult in this dungeon because everything is kind of close to each other. Wouldn't be surprised that uh, perhaps they even pull it on 
on top of the Council of Captains. That is a bit scary, though, because that Lupin's going to be there, constantly displacing them with that Shadow Smash, and it is a bit of a finicky movement fight where you want to take advantage of the bruise. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that once we actually reach that boss, but Team Poluca has pulled some more trash just up the ramp between the second and the third boss, overlooking the uh, valley leading to Harlan, of course. 84% on the board from them. Uh, they're likely not going to want to proc their fifth Reaping Wave here. They're gonna, either going to do that with Harlan or kill the, all the bosses first and then, uh, you know, get their 100% trash as we've uh, seen teams so commonly do in order to skip the last Reaping Wave. Yeah, so I believe they're just gonna get the, the last percentage that they need. They're actually doing the event now to make sure that the boss is actually attackable, the pirate event, and now we see them stealthing towards the boss, and now they, as I said, both of them saved their bloodless exactly for this spot because it is a tyrannical setting, and this boss, especially Eudora, is very, very dangerous with her shot. As we can see, uh, Barrow just dropping really, really low from this very first shot. Yes, yeah, so a lot of damage going out. DJ Frusha getting absolutely nuked. So, really, some important points to this fight. Eudora is definitely the most dangerous of the three captains. One is, of course, not available, as every week there will be a rotation of which captains, uh, two captain pairs, you have to fight here. Eudora will jump to one of the corners of this area, one of the four corners, and in a clockwise fashion do her grape shot covering the arena and blanketing it in bullets you want to make sure you avoid that it's a ton of damage she also also do some spot shots on random players which is what Nagura mentioned why we saw some of the players chunk so hard so those in combination with any kind of splash damage especially if they were to bring some of the reaping on there and accidentally get hit easily one shots a player but I think the key to this fight, Nagura, is certainly the bruise that we're seeing get tossed down right now. Yeah, so the bruise that you can see on the floor, which are those brown circles, as you can see, sometimes they will have a buff if you stand in it, and sometimes they will have a debuff. Now, uh, the players and the, the bosses are actually getting affected by this. It can be crit, haste, or it will be a damage dot that damages you. So if it's a, a bad debuff, the dot, then the players, of course, do not want to stand in it, but you want to make sure, uh, to, or at least try to have the bosses stand in it, because they will get the dot and they will be damaged by it. Now, if it's a beneficial buff like haste or crit for the players, you, you tr have to try to not pull the bosses inside it, because they will also be affected by it. And if Eudora has haste and does her powder shots faster, it's even scarier. Powder shot going off on the sink there. Um, you know, they're doing a more efficient cleave strat here but of course it's more dangerous because when we mentioned the longer Eudora is alive the more powder shots and grape shots go out and it can spell disaster for some of the players nonetheless Eudora does fall for team Poluca it should be easy sailing here uh, for the remaining captains as they look to finish them off we do see some of those brews getting tossed down uh, Copenhagen has also started their encounter certainly not too far behind they did not actually use their bloodlust so they'll likely oh, wow. be saving it for some kind of bigger trash pull perhaps even in combination with Harlan that is very interesting to see. They did not uh, pull, uh, trigger the 80% reaping wave. Oh, and we see one player die here. They do have a battle rest available to them, so they can get him back up. Uh, only one battle rest uh, left for them. But interesting choice to not use their bloodlust here. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind, though, they're still at 78% trash. They haven't even proc their fourth reaping wave, whereas Team Poluca is at 92%, already crossing the bridge over to the last area of the dungeon, which contains Harlan Sweet, the final boss of the dungeon. Captain Eudora now at 3% for Team Copenhagen on the small screen on the right, getting ready to finish that up and then clean up Captain Rule. Uh, Team Poluca really doing a more effective job of cleaving the two bosses versus Team Copenhagen. Raul was at about 23% when Eudora died from them, so certainly a bit of time gain there. We see the double sap come up from the two rogues, which is true CC, allowing the members to kind of just run right through them. Yeah, so one thing uh, we saw Team Poluca do there was they were just waiting, right? They were waiting around, the, the mobs were already stopped, and they did nothing. And they, what they actually did was wait for the quaking. Now, we see some uh, teams in the past, in last MDIs, not wait for this quaking before they shrouded. And once you shroud and you're close to each other, if you damage other people with their quaking, you actually get out of the shroud. So it's very important to wait for, for that quaking to go through and then shroud afterwards to make sure the, that the, the skip is working out. Harlan Sweet being kited around here to the corner, wanting to uh, kind of make sure you avoid that cannon barrage. Sweet, not really uh, too mechanically complex of a boss, especially versus some other end bosses in the dungeons. Uh, really just two things you have to worry about. One is his cannonball barrage that we just saw, and two is he kind of sends out these wind debuffs in one random direction. Now, when he reaches 60%, however, he will actually do these effects to an amplified value. Yeah, so the one ability we see here in the back is they sometimes spawn these ads that will fixate uh, preferably a ranged player and they will walk to them. If they actually reach the player, they will explode, knock them back and do a significant amount of damage, especially on Tyrannical. So what we see uh, Gotcha doing here, the rest of it, just wait uh, in the back until it spawns and just 
throw a Roos um, Entanglement on the mob so it doesn't move and you can just ignore this mechanic pretty much. Copenhagen now grabbing their fourth Reaping Wave. You can see the massive ghost of Ludwig von Tortolen, uh, unfortunately kind of running around with them, still has half health after they've already cleared the entirety of the uh, Reaping Pack. So they're going to need to drag him along and either try to kill him off on the bridge so they themselves can also stealth up to Harlan, or, I mean, we still have to see what they're doing with the Bloodlust. And, uh, you know, we're kind of reaching the end of the dungeon here, so it's going to be soon. Curious to see how they combine it with Harlan. I do believe Copenhagen just uh, had to change up their route on the go because of this vibe at the very start. So they chose to pull some trash that wasn't, it wasn't in their route to start with, so now they have to change things up and it's not really working out for them. They are reaching the last boss though, but Team Paluka is so far ahead at this point. They're already 43% on the boss and they only need 8% trash. Very sweet and sour finish here for them, potentially 92% right now, still on the board for trash, so they will have to pile something on top of it. Now, we've seen two options here in Nagur from some of the other teams. Uh, some people have just been bold enough to pull that double enforcer pack on top of Harlan. That's just scary. Go, yeah, very scary. Just go crazy on it. Uh, conversely, the easier and safer route is to go down to the Ravagers at the bottom, which do cast that painful motivation, uh, which takes 3% health per second, but also increases damage of all affected mobs by 45%. So uh, I assume likely they'll go with them. And similar to how you said in the last series, they're probably kind of seeing what's going on right now, and they know they're a bit ahead. Yeah, so I believe the, this Ravager pack with the painful motivation does give uh, 8% approximately, so I do believe that's what they're going to do. And now the boss is actually below 30%, so he does take... 100% uh, increased damage, meaning this is not going to take them too long anymore. Then we will see, just rush over to that Ravager pack. Now the one thing to note is uh, it only applies the debuff to themselves and two mobs around them at random, and it can stack as well. So the debuff can get applied to the same mob twice, which you don't want to happen. So what we're going to see is that they're going to throw out some CC, and they're going to have the tank pick up three mobs while the other three mobs just stay there uh, stay succeed so to make sure that the painful motivation actually goes into the right targets. So we see the move up now, looking like a, a dominant first game about to be taken here by Team Poluka. Copenhagen uh, down but not out technically just yet. They're 97% on trash, dealing with some of it right now. Harlan Sweet at 57%. Bloodlust was popped earlier, but right now we're going to have this painful motivation finish up for Team Poluka and they will quite dominantly take the first game. Very strong and clean performance here. And they did actually end up pulling those crabs, whereas uh, their counterpart did not uh, at the very beginning of the dungeon. So we are seeing actually what he did predict. Uh, they just stealth right past straight to that first boss. Now, the disadvantage of this, of course, is they have very little space to work with. Yeah, definitely. So the, the bad part about pulling all those uh, small mobs is, of course, the affixes, right? We do have Explosive and we do have Sanguine. And we saw uh, when, I believe it was Method and A who did this pull at the start, uh, they just had so many explosive spawning and that the sanguine pools drop at the same time so it did work out for them but it's just a very difficult thing to do and most other teams instead choose to just go straight to the sand queen and just they have limited space to deal with the boss, but uh, they still choose to do that rather than pulling uh, the trash in, in front. So I like what I see here from Team Pol Luka. They actually hold on to their Bloodlust for the first upheaval. Reason being that once you aggro the Queen, she actually goes down for her first upheaval within 20 seconds or so, and then you're just not really doing anything for 10, 15 seconds. Lose a lot of DPS uptime. When she comes back up, she only goes down every 40 to 45 seconds, so they get the full effect of the Bloodlust. Uh, well done by them waiting for that. Team Copenhagen has not yet used theirs as they do kind of group up these sand traps in the corner. We do know those sand traps spawn near players, which is why you're seeing them all so closely bunched up. Yeah, then there's, of course, the Sandstorm ability as well that happens for the Sand Queen here. Now, Copenhagen did pop their Bloodlust now as well. They might have just waited a little bit for cooldowns or stuff like that to be ready. But on Team Poluka's side, um, this, as I said, we sell the Sandstorm, which is a huge AoE in the whole group that actually displaces you at the same time as well. And the Sand Queen, of course, buffs, her, buffs herself with um, an Enrage kind of buff that increases her damage then, also from the Sandstorm and the upheaval. So you need to make sure that you dispel that uh, as a rest it can soothe that away. You do get them when uh, the drones die as well, so you can soothe it. it. It is not an infinite buff, though. I mean, you can, uh, it will wear off when she goes down for upheaval. Shouldn't be too much danger uh, for the Cavalier of Pro 
warriors with their mitigation right now, uh, but we will see an upheaval here in a moment uh, from either side. Now, rogues can actually cloak, and uh, as we're actually seeing right now on Team Palooka, they can cloak and kind of clear the area of sand traps as they are nature damage. The upheaval is also nature damage. Pretty big hit there on Gautia, but nothing too dangerous. Yeah, so one thing to mention as well, I, uh, which Jack mentioned earlier, is that Night Elves can actually shadow melt the upheavals to not get hit by that ability at all, if I'm not mistaken. Now, we haven't seen any shadow melts so far from Team Palooka's side, so I do believe they want to do a skip later on and just want to save that ability. There is a horrible looking gnome there, though. So there is no <laughs> Shadow Meld available for them. Sand Queen now down to 8% for Team Poluca as they look to finish that on uh, Copenhagen. Not far behind, 18%. They'll probably have to deal with the Wrath of one more upheaval, which really is just kind of a time dump as you can sit around doing nothing, waiting for the boss to reappear. Um, both teams had a very similar strategy at the beginning of this dungeon, uh, and Team Poluca's already kind of pulled a fair bit ahead. Yeah, so Team Poluka having a lot of single target damage here, did also pop their Bloodlust earlier, so it's going to be back up earlier as well. Now, of course, we do uh, see them kill this small trash back here that is in front of this uh, corridor here. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot of rogues, so the rogues can actually open all those cages and open all those uh, doors that he can't open otherwise, unless you have the profession for it. Uh, should, yeah, exactly. I think if they have jewel crafting, they can't. Oh, yeah. sorry, if it's blacksmithing. Blacksmithing uh, makes the keys. I think both. I think both, okay. Either way, there's room, so who cares? <laughs> um, uh, Click does indeed pull the trash to the side, as we saw earlier. The croc, along with that thug, making sure to let the team pass by safely, jumping back into action with Heroic Leap, and then immediately using, using that Shadow Mel to get past the two mobs at the top of the stairs. They are sapped by both rogues. True CC able to just run past them safely without incurring any proximity aggro. Yeah, so we see one of the rogues actually stay behind here while the rest of the group goes forward and just uh, skips past this trash pack because he wants to open the cages and get all those buffs for you, for the team. Unfortunately, we do have a death for Harudra over on Team Coven Hang, and they're doing the exact same skip. Uh, I believe the death is kind of forced, though. If he's still playing a dwarf, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so if that's the case, certainly he couldn't shadow meld after providing uh, the mobs, uh, pulling the mobs to the side for the rest of the group. So we'll have to see exactly how that ends up. Uh, I would assume the res has not come up yet because it is a hundred a uh, hundred yard radius for the res so you can res me from these couple of floors down i'm sure they've tested this before they've run up the floors done the skip uh done the stealth skip and now herder will be resed up safely a couple of floors up by gravity yeah one thing to mention here on copenhagen side i don't believe any of the ropes actually stayed behind to open any of those cages downstairs if i'm not completely mistaken so they will be missing some of the buffs which uh are important because it's a tyrannical setting, as I said, and the bosses just take such a long time, and there are difficult bosses too, as we saw Method and A uh, wipe consistent or wipe three times on the next boss. So those buffs uh, help you a lot, not only uh, for more damage, but it also gives you more survivability. So just to remind those at home, as we see these sanguine pools drop on the ground, uh, we are in a sanguine environment, so when a mob dies, it will drop a pool on the ground, uh, healing any friendlies, well, for them, friendlies that are in the pool or damaging any players that are there, and they do stack, so if you kill five mobs together, it's going to be a crazy amount of damage or healing on whatever enters it. Also, we have Explosive, everyone's favorite. We see some Explosive spawn here for Team Luca occasionally. Very small amount of health, but will explode for 50% of the team's health. That is in line of sight of it, uh, should you not kill it. Yeah, Explosive is also very dangerous if you're running a full melee comp because those mobs walk away when they're low HP, right? If they walk away, uh, they're still alive. That means they can spawn Explosives, and the Explosives tend to spawn close to the mobs. So if uh, the mobs all run away when they're uh, low HP, and then Explosives can spawn uh, all across the room around the area, now for melees it's going to be a lot more difficult to deal with them compared to range DPS because they have to walk there. Gravity goes down for Team Copenhagen, really kind of balls pull here as they pull it out to the side. Unfortunately, they have dropped some Sanguine in this doorway. We've seen this hall be such a problem for the previous two teams. It's really one of the most dangerous with the Sanguine explosive affix. Uh, Noct goes down as well. Haruder is just fighting for his life right now as a lot of those fire dot debuffs have hit him from the arsonists within this hallway. And I mean, the strikers are just sitting, uh, the speakers, excuse me, and the striker are just sitting in that Sanguine pool, being healed to full. It's going to be a full team wipe for them. Sims, I believe, manages to get out by just kind of uh, um, vanishing and keeping safe, saving that five seconds worth of penalty by dying. But we're going to have to wait for Gravity now to re-stealth, get all the way back upstairs, re-res Harudra and Noct, and they're going to have to go at it again. 
Yeah, unfortunately, the rogues do not have an out of combat rest. It's the one thing I think they're missing because else they could have rested the healer back up and he could have mass rest. But yeah, the rogues surviving vanishing doesn't really help them at all because the healer still died and he needs to get back to rest up the rest of the group here. You know, I do agree with you. Rogues don't have enough and they should be given <laughs> a res. Uh, let everyone yes. know this fact. Um, Gravity is finally back upstairs. Starts resing for Team Hogan, uh, Copenhagen. Team Poluka looking really solid. Zero deaths on the board as they very safely grind through this hallway, making sure they eliminate all potential threats as they finally engage Jess Howless, the second boss of the dungeon, along with their first reaping pack at 21%. Yeah, so one thing to note here, uh, Howless, once he reaches, I believe it's 75%, he will walk around this corridor and he will actually uh, get hit by those um, pools that are in this corridor already from the tree, uh, previous trash. So you have to be very careful because he will walk around and open those cages, right? If he stands still in one of those pools, uh, exactly uh, open the cage there, then it will heal for quite a bit. Yeah, they will indeed. And we saw that be kind of a, an issue for Method and A in the previous series where they had one wipe with Jess kind of healing pretty much to full, actually, standing in a Sanguine on the side of the room. Uh, most teams seem kind of to bring him in that little nook at the very beginning of the hallway. So we'll see if Team Poluka will follow suit in that sense. Copenhagen finally back on their feet and moving as quickly as they can through the hallway, making sure to eliminate any explosive threats that may spawn from the trash. Yeah, so Copenhagen, of course, a little bit behind to Team Poluka because of this full team wipe that they had. But Team Poluka actually almost reached the percentage that they need until they can go to the cannon. So they did pretty much almost all of the trash already. They only need to do the cannon part. Of course, they need to kill this boss first, though, because we have seen the team struggle with this one. Yeah, just a combination of um, having some of the explosives spawn from the people in the cells that you're saying uh, in combination with Sanguine dropping, an interrupt being missed for one of the Howls. I mean, a lot of problems in the previous series. Explosives of galore right now for Team Poluka as they cleave them down, making sure that they handle those appropriately. Fear goes out from Jess, interrupted at the absolute last second. Flashing daggers now. The team will need to line of sight this, else they will suffer a very large physical hit. Yeah, so this boss uh, in this phase is actually pretty difficult because of Bobby. Now, Bobby does have uh, a lot of casts that also need to be interrupted, especially the, one of the most important casts is that he will jump on a random player, he will kind of channel a slash, and he will stun them for the duration. Now, you can assign interrupts, which I believe most of those teams obviously do, so you will assign interrupts for the boss's howling uh, fear cast, and you will also assign people for Bobby's cast. Now, if the person who is assigned to interrupt Bobby will actually get stunned by Bobby, then you of course need a backup. So it's a uh, it's kind of difficult to coordinate your um, your interrupts for this boss, and there's a lot of things who can go wrong. Team Poluka is certainly quite stable here, uh, adversely to Copenhagen right now. That just did a massive pull down the hall. Uh, Cerrone is just dipping sub 10% a couple of times there, but managing to hang on. A lot of trash here, but I've been noticing they've also been missing a lot of kicks on the speakers with their watery dome, uh, which uh, hopefully they would like to save some kicks for because it provides that massive absorb bubble on the rest of the trash, and they don't exactly have an offensive dispel. We know they're running a line, so they don't have Arcane Torrent as a Blood Elf, which you know was a former popular meta choice uh, in previous MDI. So a lot of time wasted for them here as they start to move through and get to, ready to, uh, to pull Jess as well. Yeah, we see Copenhagen are going to go a little bit over count here for the trash percentage that they actually need because we see on Team Poluka's side they just did the trash skip uh, for the for the uh, through the cannon part I mean and you only need 22% you can get the rest percentage on the cannons now of course we saw Frusha die here because he can't be an adult right so of course they're missing those five seconds again and they have to use the rest again to get him back up it's for the greater good <laughs> shaman sacrificing themselves for the greater good of that pool Team Poluka now getting into position for the cannons in the corner. Now, cannons usually are everybody's favorite for the players. They kill reaping, they kill everything in their way. However, it's a slightly more difficult here. Um, they do have the favor of at least one range DPS, so the entire melee team won't be responsible for some of the explosives that spawn, but the cannons do not kill explosives. So you can't just outwardly ignore them. You will either have to line of sight them, or of course they do have the support of the ranged in the form of DJ Frusha, uh, getting some shocks and bursts in on those as needed. Yeah, we see um, the cannon 
uh, shooting the right part, so triggering this pack on the right side, while we see the warrior actually, the, the proud warrior, go inside the room. He will pull some of those mobs that they skipped earlier back out, so you can kill them with the cannon. Now, this is the important part about Tolagor as a dungeon, is to just do as much trash as possible with those cannons, because they just do so much damage uh, to the mobs, and it's just so efficient to kill them with it, because not only does the shot from the cannon do damage, but it also knocks them back. So essentially, those mobs don't actually need to be tanked, so you can avoid all the damage from them and just kill them with those cannons. So we can see the cannon doing an absolute mass amount of damage for Baru. They're almost reaching the damage that a prot warrior can output when Thunderclap spamming as the mobs kind of funnel through the door. The problem is they are spawning a lot of sanguine in that doorway, so as the mobs come in, they start to park there, and there are some marksmen, uh, kind of physical ranged mobs. They'll park in that uh, sanguine and just be unkillable, especially with how many stacks are there, but they do manage to move them out, and I'm liking this positioning a lot. They've marked the tank, they've marked click, they know where he is so that the shots have a, you know, a fairly small radius to make sure that they don't accidentally clip the tank or the melee that are trying to help cleave the reaping pack down, so well done by Team Poluka here, just reaching 49% for trash. Jess Howless in the second phase here for Team Copenhagen. Yeah, so it's very uh, very important that you don't move around randomly uh, while the cannon uh, is going on because of course the player in the cannon wants to kill the trash mobs. Now if you're uh, if you're a melee player and you you go like, "Oh, let's me just go in and interrupt this mob and the player in the cannon shoots at the same time, then you are going to die. It's going to one shot you. So you definitely have to be careful here and uh, as you said the marks on especially in the tank very important. And uh, one more thing to note as you said explosive just so uh, so difficult to deal with because of you know the explosives just don't get killed by the cannons and uh, we saw Frusha actually being very, very good to deal with them because if you have a full melee lineup, they can't go close and kill them because else they die to the cannon. But the Frusha actually has ranged and can kill the explosives to help out the, the cannon person. Or, or the cannon needs to wait for the melee to go in and then they lose a ton of damage from the cannon. So yeah. certainly not a good combination. We do see Barua finally get back in. The cannon dips out for a second just to get that Tricks of the Trade active on Click, who's hiding around the corner, making sure that the aggro from the mobs is not turned onto the cannon uh, immediately. Uh, killing him quite quickly, quite frankly. Uh, got you dipping just a bit down from some of the damage, but no problem for them as Copenhagen is now at 12%, 11% on Jess Howlis, looking to clean up the rest of the fight. So the, the actual Jess Howlis encounter, pretty clean for both teams. I mean, no problem. The wipe we saw earlier from Copenhagen came from a trash issue. Yeah, so uh, the elemental time, I just saw the earth elemental come out from uh, Frusha here, which is also one thing that is really good, especially for this cannon part, right? Because if you taunt them with your earth elemental, then the tank doesn't have to go in, and the tank is not in danger of dying. So you can just uh, stack them all up, pop the earth elemental, similar to the trees of a moonkin, and you can, d you can have the cannon person just shoot on top of them and not worry about killing the tank. Moon, can you say? <laughs> we saw them once. Yeah, we did. Uh, Team Paul Luca just waiting for the remaining three mobs to kind of funnel in towards the cannon. They're at 69% right now on the board. Uh, once those die, I think it's about time for that they switch to the far cannon because they do need to kind of go around this balcony area to get to the third boss at some point soon. Herder dripping a bit low here for Team Copenhagen as they run up, but does manage to get the um, Shadow Meld off as a Night Elf. Knocked, unfortunately, does not make it, and they will have to use the res on him in just a moment. Now, one thing to note, of course, is that both teams are still saving that Lala they used it at the very start of the dungeon, but now they're most likely saving it for the very last boss, because uh, it is a very dangerous boss fight, especially in Tyrannical, so you just... If you only get two bloodlusts anyway in this in this whole dungeon, then you might as well just save it for the most difficult boss, which is the last one. You know, with how dangerous... Um Jess and Bobby are in this dungeon, and the fact that all the teams are seemingly saving their bloodlust for the last boss, perhaps it wouldn't be the worst idea to actually use bloodlust on the second boss as opposed to the first. Uh, the first really isn't too dangerous. You, you have an infinite amount of space, even if it's a small amount. You do just kind of circle around with cloaks, but either way, they do know best here. Whatever works best for the teams as they are well practiced in this dungeon, they do reposition over to the next cannon for Team Poluka, dealing with the 85% wave, but Click does go down here. Gatya does not have oh, him no. at all. Gatya goes down as well, and this could be absolutely disastrous. Now, DJ Frusha, if he goes down, might have his Ankh available, in, in which he will actually be able to kind of save the team from certain doom as they all do white here. Full five-man white. The last explosive is about to go off. We'll see. He does have the uh, self-res available, if I'm not mistaken, okay. so we'll see in a moment. There's one problem here, though, because the Reaping mobs did reset, and they are standing in his walkway. Uh, uh, the Reaping 
aggro of the mobs is really, really high. So if Rusha... Uh, oh, and there's one trash map here too, which is very, very bad. So if he will ank here, he will pull this looter map and he will probably pull some of the reaping too. Yes, Ankh will uh, not be, I don't think, an option here. I think they're probably just debating on what's going on. I mean, they got to do something. <laughs> yeah. But they're probably talking about it right now. Uh, the gravity of the situation increases for Team Copenhagen as the rest of Druid does go down right now. Harudra dipping a bit low as well as he runs around with 21 stacks from the Reaping Mob. Does manage to survive as Resuscitate is cast by the Windwalker Monk, getting gravity up. So they kind of avoided a close call there as well. Could have been wiped should some more mobs have survived as Harudra was barely hanging on with those uh stacks but uh, team poluka has uh, been silenced it seems at the moment yeah so i think they're just debating on what they're going to do now because they have all these reaping mobs that reset and now uh, if you really okay we saw fusha ank here uh, i do believe he would uh, he aggroed them up but uh, we don't see it right now now on copenhagen side we once gravity is up this is their chance to just kind of uh, catch up to Team Poluca because they are far ahead, but this probably cost them a lot of time. I believe what happened was they were waiting for that looter that we saw, the Volpera, uh, to kind of despawn or move. I don't think it actually belonged there. I've never seen yeah, the Volpera there. So, so once it despawned, he popped his Ankh, got in the cannon right away, and decimated oh, yeah. the remainder of the <laughs> reaping. So that's actually a really clever play from them. Managed to recover to the best of their ability for the full wipe. Gravity's still down on Team Copenhagen. Not still, but once again down, rather, on Team Copenhagen, accruing eight deaths on the board as a huge amount of trash billows through the open doorway from the previous room, and they try to get it down. Some explosive spawning on their end as well. So I do believe there might be some problem uh, with the, a disconnect or something going on in Copenhagen side because Gravity did receive a rest and just didn't take it. So they're trying to continue the dungeon without the hero right now, which of course is a big problem. If one damage dealer can't connect, then you can probably still finish the dungeon. But there we go. So Gravity is back now. He did manage to accept the rest, uh, thankfully. So they can continue uh, doing the dungeon. Now Team Poluka is back on track too. They are on 85% trash, so they only need to kill a little bit more until they reach the last uh, the next boss you know unfortunately for copenhagen if there's one spot in the dungeon that the healer needs to dc it's probably the best spot here with the cannon as yes. they're able to cc and just kind of shoot some mobs down really quickly team poluka now just dealing with the last percentage of trash that they need um 85 they're certainly not going to go to 100 i believe they need 92 or 93 after they kill the third boss in order to finish their 100. yeah so they are on their way to the second to last boss which we talked about earlier is usually not the most difficult boss of this uh, of this dungeon it does take a long time because it is tyrannical but as long as you control those barrels properly and you make sure the cinder flame doesn't uh, explode the barrels around and covering the whole room then you should be fine here we see darth captain uh, valeria here with her <laughs> evil saber she gets pulled across the room now we talked about this boss in the previous series but just to refresh everyone's memories at home uh, the key mechanics of this fight are really the explosive barrels that spawn around the room players can interact with them by picking them up and placing them in other parts of the room the idea is here to place all of the barrels in one nice pile away from the boss across the room so that the melee can uh, have a lot of uptime she will target cinder flame in the direction of one of the barrels causing them to light on fire and explode with this massive explosive radius as we see here yeah we do see i think a little bit of a different strat coming out from team paluka compared to uh, the teams that we've seen in tolagar before because they are tanking the bus to the corners of the room which we have seen uh, at the start of bfa on live servers too now in, in the meantime on live server they switched the strategy to just tank her in the middle and just dragging the barrels out of whichever direction she casts the cinder flame on because this the corners of the room just of course just leave you less space right and if there's one barrel that is too close then it can very easily easily just cover this uh, corner. So uh, we see the more riskier strat here coming out from Team Poluka. It is paying off so far as uh, Night Captain Valir reaches 48%. Once again, the corner proves safe for them as the barrels are exploding around the room. Now, there is one more thing that actually causes the barrels to ignite, not just her frontal cinder flame, but rather the fire zone that you see go down on the ground. It will go down under current barrel locations, eventually will erupt and cause those barrels uh, within that area to explode nonetheless. So they're actually kind of using that to their advantage because the cinder flame of the barrels are spread are not hitting everything we can see here even right now on the screen the mismatch of the circles meaning the barrels are separated a fair bit they move out of their own fire zones there and copenhagen has now passed their final reaping wave at 91 percent and they're getting ready to aggro night captain soon 
Yeah, so they're actually not that far behind anymore. You also have to consider the deaths on both sides. So Copenhagen does have eight deaths, but Team Paluka also has six steps so uh, it's only 10 seconds different in between those two of course as i said both those teams are saving their bloodless not using it uh, for valeria here because she's not very dangerous and you can see even the rest of it doing approximately 10k average dps single target dps on this fight just because there's not much tank damage going on and not much other da damage in general as long as you deal with those battles yeah certainly you just need a quick dispel and actually once again there is a dot that goes out and if the warrior is lucky enough to get it on them they could just spell reflect it right back on the boss it does it can cast on different targets the warden here is successfully sapped i guess that answers the mystery of whether or not you can uh grapple sap and not yeah. just have to shadow step sap but the sap is up nonetheless as click runs up and grabs the remaining uh two no he doesn't they're actually doing a full skip here so he's gonna run over pull the wardens to the side they do move particularly slow because they deal incredibly high melee damage uh, and once they get close enough he will likely just use his shadow meld there it is the rest of the team has moved safely on the far side and they're getting ready to aggro uh, definitely the most dangerous boss yeah so this boss is so dangerous because uh, of the explosive rounds which is uh, one ability that he does on range targets preferably they of course use their bloodlust here but yeah since they do have two range dps on with frusha and the rest of the it here uh, those two people will always get the explosive rounds with one third random target now the more range you have the more difficult this is to heal because if you have to focus heal uh, three uh, of the same people and you get a double uh, of explosive rounds so a double means that he's gonna do it right after another pretty much uh, giving the healer less time to heal them up before the second round hits is much more difficult than if they could if they are spread around the whole group meaning that they don't have to heal one person up but they can just heal the other people up instead I'm not sure if uh, maybe I dreamed it but I think at some point they did actually hot fix it so you can't have double wave anymore uh, double stack so you can have yeah you can't have double debuff stacks but they still will do the round so if you already have a debuff on you while they do the round you will not get a second stack but you will still get the initial damage from the explosive round which is the most dangerous part about it of course so we see uh, more of a traditional positioning here with the tank uh, uh, believe me from experience the camera view here from the tank is not fun <laughs> observers please don't do that um, but we are seeing the dead eye here on DJ Frusha who already had the debuff so somebody else will need to step in the way of that we do see that evade come up from Barua to make sure that he can safely take the actually no it wasn't evade sorry uh, he just uh, took the the dead eye to the face there dead eye needs to be rotated every third shot the debuff does last long enough that somebody two other people need to step in before yours is cleaned off and agree you did mention you can actually parry it as well so if somebody does manage to parry it they will not get the debuff applied to them yeah so we see the ropes just rotating in and out just taking uh, the shots for the range dps here as the range already takes so much damage from these explosive rounds so of course you, you try to avoid uh, the big shot on them as much as possible especially uh Frusha and gotcha who are taking just so much damage from these explosive rounds but we even see gotcha even going cat form and doing some damage to uh, to the boss here which is a uh, very risky because as i said this is a difficult boss to heal but he's min maxing everything here doing 7.2k dps yeah, I mean, every bit helps, certainly, as they're about to down uh, Corgus here. Copenhagen still moving along quite well. They decide to deal with some of the trash. They have killed the third boss. They decide to deal with some of the trash before getting to Overseer Corgus as well. They have their Bloodlust available. They are quite behind, though, at this point. They've had an extra death on the board. Last time I checked, it was eight. They are now up to nine. So you're looking good for Team Paluka here. Now, it's not going to be over just yet. Corgus does need to fall here, and then they will need to backtrack and deal with all the trash on the cannon. Shouldn't take too long, uh, but if some, I mean, something can always go wrong. Yeah, so Copenhagen did catch up quite a bit, to be honest, because they did have this crucial full group wipe, which cost them so much time to get back. And we saw, of course, um, Gravity just not being able to to get back into the game for a while here. But they caught up quite a bit. They did pull the last boss here. Of course, Team Poluka is down with the boss, but have to go back and kill this trash. Now, it is a tyrannical setting, though, and the boss takes quite a while. So they're pretty much, I would say, they're one to two minutes behind at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a huge difference between them. So as long as they don't have any mess up with the cannons or the orbs here, Team Pool Luca is going to look to have a quite dominant performance here with a 2-0 sweep, showing why they don't feel they belong in this loser's bracket, trying to climb back out and uh, kind of win this whole thing. We will have to crown that winner today. Team Pool Luca to 94% right now as the cannon starts decimating everything. Well uh, backpedaled here by Click to make sure that he can still hold aggro, deal a bit of damage while the cannon decimates the mobs from behind. 98 for Team Pool Luca. One more kill and it's going to spell it 2-0 for Team Poluca as they advance in the loser's bracket. Wipes on both sides in this messy Toldegord 